Stephen, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm acutely aware that I'm the only thing that's standing between you and drinks and dinner this evening, so I'm going to try and keep this punchy and quick. So what am I going to talk about? Well, a lot of actually what you're going to hear is builds on exactly what you've heard today. I particularly want to talk about the challenges of resource efficiency and bring it alive by using food as an example. So, you know, what do we think the challenges are, particularly for the food and drink sector? What role can it play and how can you all help deliver against the challenges and the opportunities that this sector faces over the next 20 years? And then I'll find out whether that works and maybe I'll try that one. Yes, there we go. Um, so, I'm going to quickly talk about RAP, for those of you who don't know very much about us. Uh, talk about the trends. I'm just going to build a little bit on what you've heard a number of times today already. Opportunities specifically in food. The progress that's already been made. So, there is some progress here that's going in the right direction, but we need some more help. There's a hell of a lot more that needs to be done, and then I'm going to draw some conclusions. So, who are RAP? RAP are the Waste and Resources Action Programme. We're a not-for-profit company set up by government to deliver their policies on waste and resource efficiency. So our vision is a world without waste where resources are used sustainably. I hope you can't argue with that. That seems like a very sensible thing to do. Um, and the, our particular priorities at the moment are minimising resource use in products and buildings and diverting priorities of materials from landfill. And in particular, at the heart of how we think about things is using the circular economy approach. And that's so hopefully I'm going to build a little bit more about that over the next uh, few minutes. But just to sort of get yeah, where do we focus at the moment, I mean, down this axis, you can see down this side here, that's our traditional approach. You've seen this loads of times a day. And of course, actually what we want to do is to make that much more efficient, but also make the resources go round and round those loops. Uh, and where do we need to particularly focus on that? Well, if you look in the economy, some of the most resource intensive areas are buildings, food and drink, and products and services. So those are the focuses that RAP has got over the next few years. Okay, so trends. We've heard a great deal about trends. We all know we're moving towards a 9 billion uh, people by 2050. That's at the low end of the predictions. But not only that, I think the key, there's a couple of key things in there. They're going to be living in cities. And increasingly, the 2 billion people that uh, Mike Barry was talking about earlier on of moving into the middle classes, their diet is changing. The diet is moving towards a more Western-style model. And actually, also, when you look at wastage, What's interesting is in developing economies, the wastage is largely in the supply chain and not much in the home. As you move to more developed economies, the wastage is more in the home and less in the supply chain. So there are big challenges, big challenges which are about having resource implications of us having a burgeoning population, largely living in cities and having a more Western style diet. Also, we're increasingly living on our own. That's another consequence of the move towards societies like the Western side model, and that is a more resource intensive approach. And of course, we're traveling more. So we travel around the world, therefore we need to actually be able to feed and clothe those people as they're migrating around. So yeah, you've seen this before, you know, we have a looming supply chain issue. Yeah, seven billion people enjoying the lifestyles that we enjoy in the West means three planets worth of resources. Clearly, we don't have three plants with resources. So how are we going to be able to deliver against the expectations? Fantastic opportunity, as Mike was saying, but also significant challenge. So just to bring it alive a little bit for food, what does it mean for food? And this is data that came from the foresight work that John Bennington led a couple of years ago. You know, by 2030, to produce the food that is predicted for this popular urban population, energy is going to go up by about 50%, the increase of 50% in demand for food, and an increased demand of 30% in water. And just to pick on that water, recent studies suggest that about 70% of all the water use in the world is irrigation for food. So we've got to increase that by another 30%. That's a massive amount of thing. But actually, there's a massive amount of food we've got to find. That's a massive amount of energy we've got to find, and we've got to generate it in a way that doesn't actually contribute more towards climate change. Huge challenges. Oh, by the way, we're actually not managing that food at the moment terribly well. Just take the examples there. The UNFAO estimate about a third of all the food that's produced in the world is wasted. That's 1.3 billion tonnes. 1.3 billion tonnes. That's a shed load of waste. That would fill an awful lot of Wembley stadiums. And interestingly, one in four calories, so all the, the really important stuff, is wasted in that process. 
Just to bring it home to the UK, we reckon about just over 15 million tonnes worth of waste, and being a Western democracy, we're actually more in the, uh, wasting more in the home, but around 7.2 million tonnes, uh, with the, other, uh, the rest of the waste actually split between the manufacturing, uh, agriculture, uh, hospitality, uh, and the public sector. So, how do you start thinking about tackling these things? This is something we've talked a fair bit about today. But one thing that's got a bit of currency this year, a lot of people have been writing about it, is the circular economy. Is that a way of actually applying your thinking to food and, and actually helping us come up with solutions to deliver against these fantastic challenges we've just been talking about? Well, there's been some great things said about the circular economy. Uh, you know, can we turn the 200 million tonnes worth of waste reduced in the UK, turn that into a resource? That could be an interesting solution. Maybe there's about £23 billion pounds worth of savings to be had by taking a more circular economy approach. And I believe McKinsey's, when they did their analysis, reckoned that 30% of the new resources we would need uh, and to deliver the change over the next uh, 20 years could indeed come from efficiencies arising from the circular economy and actually making better use of the materials as we go around. So maybe, maybe this approach has some, uh, some merit. OK, so let's consider that in a bit more detail. Well, OK, so does it actually help us in delivering some of the outputs we need? Well, in terms of the environmental outputs, as we've heard a couple of times, that yeah, I think this does help, making things more efficiently and then taking the stuff we've got and actually making it go around the economy several times. That does sound like it, make, it, it works, reducing carbon, reduce walk, re 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 reducing materials. But does it also make business sense? Again, coming back to the challenge you heard earlier on today. Well, I think it does. I think it can help us deal particularly with price stability, making better use of the food that we produce, It'll help with supply chain resilience by improving the competitiveness of the supply chains. And when the competition for resources comes along, we can make better use of that. And actually, has particularly, can it help us as an economy be more competitive in the world that's coming up? I think it probably can. But how are we doing? Well, this is interesting. What's quite interesting about the food in the UK, and we put this together, it looks a bit like a Sankey, guys, but it's not quite a Sankey. We don't quite have enough information to make it a Sankey, so sorry about that. But we did try, I think is a short answer. I did try. But what it does show is in the UK, we do have a circular economy around food. It ain't great. There's still quite a lot of losses from it, but it's there. So just to, to, let's have a look at it. So agriculture going through to design and manufacture, What's quite interesting about, about uh, this, this whole loop as you go around is uh, this actually is responsible for 20% of our territorial emissions, 70% of our water footprint, 55% of our total packaging, and contributes 7% of our GVA. So this is quite a resource-intensive sector. That probably is actually something you, you completely agree with. But it's interesting that this is this consumes a lot of resources and therefore there's a lot of potential here to actually try and make things much, much more efficient. But as you go around, what we're finding is there's waste, at, there's waste uh, in the design and manufacture, there's waste in agriculture, and there's waste in dis uh, distribution and retail and in consumption. But we are capturing a fair bit of it and it's going through into AD and composting and that is producing re renewable fertilisers that are going back uh, into agriculture. So. Yeah, on the one hand, this is a very resource intensive sector, uh, which could benefit from some significant improvements. On the other hand, it employs a heck of a lot of people and 3.3 million in the economy and actually does also have a nascent circular economy that perhaps we could build on going forward. So how might we do that? Well, this is where I think we need your help. I think there are three key things to do if you're going to actually de deliver against the challenges that we've been talking about earlier today. We've really got, to, really got to reinvent the way we design, produce, and sell products in this space. Use the systems thinking that the circular economy actually encourages you, and use that to drive change. That's absolutely fundamental. If we don't do that, I don't think we can meet those challenges personally. That is at the forefront of it. And how we do that, I think, is the big challenge going forward. I think we've got to prevent waste. I mean, that's absolutely key. You've said that already loads of times. We're making some progress in that space, but there's still plenty more to do there. And the other thing is what is being produced, we need to make the best possible use of because we can't eliminate waste. It's not what well, there is unavoidable waste. There's stuff we've got to do. It. So can we do the best, make the best of that and use that to improve the resource efficiency of the loop? I think we can. Okay, so what progress have we made so far? So 
within RAP, we've been working to try and build a little bit, put a little bit of building blocks in place, help the circular economy uh, be developed. And I want to particularly focus on a few things here. So um, on Product Sustainability Forum, I'll say some more about that in a minute. We're looking at trying to improve the design of products and actually reduce, improve the sustainability of products going through. With Resource Efficient Scotland, we're trying to reduce the energy, um, uh, improve the energy efficiency of food manufacture, um, and reduce the waste associated with it. Courtauld commitment is fundamentally about reducing waste uh, in the grocery supply chain. Federation House commitment, and I'm of you in the room are signatures to that as well, is about reducing water in the supply chain. So these are about trying to reduce that. And then we've got Love Food Hate Waste to actually help consumers reduce waste. Then we've got encouragement to help collection and capture more of that material that is wasted and turn it through ADN composting into products that then can be used, for example, on land to produce food more efficiently. So we're trying to do that. And what I'm going to do in just a few minutes is, is just take a few of those examples and bring them to life a little bit. And also say we're going to need some more help to deliver some of this stuff. So taking the Product Sustainability Forum first, uh, and this, I think, builds on quite a lot of what's already been said today. What it aims to do has the following vision. To make everyday products that are designed resource efficiently to maximize environmental impact, sorry, to minimize environmental impact and maximize environmental benefit throughout the life of the product, while also taking into account resource availability. This is to support more sustainable lifestyles by encouraging sustainable consumption and production. So fairly uh, straightforward thing. At the moment, PSF is fundamentally focusing on, I'd say, grocery retail. It's focused on food and it's focused on home improvement areas. It hasn't really gone beyond that, although the thinking from this has also come into another one of perhaps areas on textiles called the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan, which is trying to do a similar thing within clothing. Okay, so how is it doing it? So it's, at the moment, what it is, it's about 85 different companies plus governments, plus NGOs, plus academics, a pre-competitive forum uh, to, uh, for those interested in quantifying, communicating, and reducing product-related impact. What we're doing with that is then to turn that into an evidence gathering, take that evidence, and try and act on that evidence to deliver real change. So bring that to life. It's doing it about based on five metrics. We'd like to do six, but five is what we've started with to try and take evidence on products, particularly at the category level, and try and work out where to focus. We're using greenhouse gases, we're using uh, energy, both of those actually there's decent data out there already well published on product category levels. Water, less good, we've got some good evidence, not fantastic. Materials, one of the big gaps and one of the reasons I couldn't put up a Sankey for food is we don't know how much materials go into that loop. We know the amount of materials that flow through. We know how much is sold in tons terms. We know how much by, we can do that by category. But how much stuff is used to make that stuff, don't know that. So that's an area where we could really do with some additional information. Waste, we know total waste, but we don't know it very well by category level unless it's in the home. But we do know it in the home pretty well. Biodiversity, yeah, that's a really useful area. Natural capital might be a better way of thinking about it. That's a metric that actually the, the, the forum is thinking we, we need to understand, but we don't know enough about it just yet to bring it in. So what have we done with that information? Well, we've tried to take a pragmatic approach. And again, it's building on some of the things that have been sent, said today. If you want to try and improve the environmental performance of products, there are buckets of them. So where do you focus? Well, perhaps a Pareto analysis based on the metrics I've just discussed is a good way of going forward. Focus on the product categories that have the biggest impact and then look within those product categories for where the hot spots of environmental impact actually are and focus on that. So that's what we've tried to do uh, over the last couple of years. So we've, first of all is to actually sort of say over the first couple of years what we've tried to do is to build a database based at product category level and we published that earlier this year um, on the website of pretty much everything in grocery that we could find. And what we found was you can do a Pareto and there are about 30 product categories that make up about 75% of all of the impact. And then within that, you can then identify the hotspots and then start tackling the hotspots. And that's the stage we're at now. We're trying to put partnerships together to try and reduce the impact of those hotspots. Okay. But take another example of what's happening in this space is the call of commitment, uh, and this is trying to put waste prevention into practice. And again, we've had some success in this space. I suspect there's a heck of a lot more to do here. But what we've tried to do 
is to focus on three core areas, supply chain waste, packaging waste, and, help, and consumer food waste particularly, and, and put together a consortium of, of companies that are working towards common goals in this space to see if we can make a real difference together. Uh, and what we've done is we've got signatories to the Courtauld commitment. We're on our second phase of Courtauld, and these are, these are the, the signatories of phase two. The, the thinking behind this is, yeah, we, as you've, we've already heard today, there is, there is waste at factory level that's actually within the control of the factory, and there's a lot of variation there, and there's a lot of improvement we can do there. There is also waste that's a result of the way the supply chain operates. And actually trying to find ways to get the supply chain to collaborate, give common signals down the supply chain that we're trying to tackle this, and then allow the supply chain to respond. And if you've got the top of the supply chain all talking roughly speaking with the same voice, this might make a difference. So that's what we've tried to do with the Courtauld commitment. We've also tried to get the, the companies to start thinking about how they can help consumers reduce food waste by the way they design their products and taking their products forward. So, to just taking the, you know, uh, what, we, what we found in terms of the causes of waste in the supply chain, and this I think probably accords with a lot of the work that you've already done in this space, there are a lot of reasons that result in waste in the supply chain. And therefore, and a lot of them, yes, they, some of them can be tackled within companies, but some of them re require collaboration. And that's what the Courtauld commitment tried to do, was to encourage collaboration to try and drive change and to try and reduce waste and send that common message through the supply chain. And there's been some success. Supply chain collaborations at the heart. I really like the Morrisons and uh, Carrie Noom ones here. This is a question of getting the top of the supply chain talking to its major supplier, and the supplier saying, well, if you did it this way, I could really reduce the amount of waste that I'm generating and that you may well be generating in store, and that would actually save us both money. And that resulted in a 33% reduction in that approach. A really interesting way of trying to work together to reduce waste. Product innovation, that's obviously a clear area here where we can make real differences, and the example I've given there is, is uh, a change of packaging which doubles the shelf life of potatoes. That had a significant impact in the ASDA supply chain. Um, improved forecasting. So Musgrave's working with UB to try and actually forecast better, particularly around promotions. That resulted in a 13% reduction. And then real-time systems, Sainsbury's employing real-time systems going through the supply chain. That also reduced their in-store waste by around 2%. A lot of this resulted in a, a significant effort between signatories and then taking that information and sharing that across uh, court of commitment and wider because these are all public, uh, hopefully uh, has helped to encourage change. But not, to, not only we're trying to reduce waste in the supply chain, but we're also trying to encourage um, uh, retailers and brands to help consumers reduce food waste, and also to encourage consumers themselves to reduce food waste. And our strategy here has been twofold. One is to try and help consumers um, reduce the food waste themselves by raising the awareness, and then through Love Food, Hate Waste, our campaign in this space, give them simple tools and techniques to help them change if they want to, and save money. And the big motivation here is reducing money. 50 pounds a month you can save by throwing away less food. But also, then using the Courtauld commitment and the signatories to actually make it as easy as possible for people to reduce food waste in the home. Second angle. And that's about design, that's about promotions, that's about in-store information. And that's been reasonably successful in terms of trying to do it. So um, the example I want to give here, and this is perhaps an interesting one just before dinner, is baked beans. Now obviously for those, baked beans, one of our delicacies, one of our national delicacies. Uh, one of the interesting things about baked beans is when we did the research into uh, food waste in the home, what happens with baked beans? People buy a tin of beans, they open it up, they pour it out, uh, they pop it back in the fridge, in the tin, and then a couple of days later they look at it and go, Ugh, and chuck it away. So we shared that with Heinz, and indeed all of the signatories, and they said, oh, okay. And they went away and thought about it a bit, and they thought, oh, I'll tell you what, Here's a fridge pack. Now this has got five portions of beans within it. And once you open it, on the side it's got a portion calculator so you can see through a clear window exactly how much, so you can know how much to dispense, so you get that rough, roughly right. And then you can seal it up and put it back in the fridge and it'll last five days. So when you come back the next day and have a look at it and open it up, it looks as fresh as when it started. So it reduces food waste. The key reason I'm banging on about beans here is this is a design solution that not only reduces waste down the supply chain because, hey presto, that packaging is 40% less than the equivalent normally is, but also it actually helps reduce waste in the home and you get a complete systems solution. 
And it's that type of thinking, I think, that we need to encourage going forward if we're going to deliver the challenges that I've been talking about earlier on in the presentation. So what progress has been made through these two approaches? Well, we've made some progress in there. About 2.3 million tonnes of waste prevented, um, uh, saving around 3.5 billion. Most of that is actually food. The, the cost savings is in the home, although a significant amount of that is in the supply chain. Um, and the reason I've got a little picture of um, Wembley Stadium in there is that that 2.3 million tonnes would actually fill Wembley Stadium to the brim twice. So that's a significant amount of waste. It would be very smelly. I wouldn't like to be there if they did it, but uh, even so, it gives you an idea. What about closing the loop? Well, that's another angle just to keep in your mind and one of the, uh, as, as we go forward and try and drive this forward is actually, do you know, you know, we aren't going to eliminate waste, we aren't going to get it down to zero, so we want to make the best use of the material going through. And one of the ways you can do that with food, for example, is taking material, yeah, there's some great stuff you could do with it, you could actually use it to manufacture um, as a feedstock for manufacturing fine chemicals. That could be a really interesting solution, not one that we've got to just yet. What we have got here and now is anaerobic digestion, which can actually take that food waste and convert it into biogas and to produce a fertiliser. And interestingly, uh, uh, both of those outputs, obviously biogas you can use to generate heat and power, um, and biofertiliser you can use to reduce the, um, uh, the carbon impact of the food that's grown. Of course, actually this can be distributed. So you can put this on farms that actually reduces the carbon impact of the production of food in the first place. So it begins to contribute overall to the reduction in uh, resources required for the whole loop. Interestingly now, AD costs about £35 a tonne, landfill costs about £90 a tonne, you know, why wouldn't you? So it's, the economics have moved now so that this actually is becoming increasingly effective. But to give you an idea, a tonne of food, 300 kilowatt hours of electricity if you just burnt it, uh, the biogas for electricity. And interestingly, there's been a massive increase in the amount of plants that are around the site and indeed the capacity. So when, uh, you know, back in 2007 when we started in this, the capacity was of the order of 100,000 tonnes. It's now about 1.4 million tonnes. That's a huge growth, but that, the, the reason I wanted to emphasise that is here are commercial opportunities that the, the circular economy can pose. You know, you're helping close the loop means new plant, means uh, new jobs, uh, means new equipment and right across the country. There's some real advantages that's come from that. So, without rushing through that, just draw a few conclusions here which I hope will be helpful. I, the trends, and this is something you've heard loads of times today, so I'm really only repeating what other people have already said. There are huge opportunities, there are huge challenges. And hopefully by bringing it alive a little bit with food, you can see the scale of the opportunities that we've got and the scale of the challenges we're trying to I think key to delivering against those challenges is systems thinking. And I think the circular economy can really help us, our minds think about that and think about it right the way through from the agricultural stage, right the way through to end of life and make the best use of the resource all the way around that loop. And that may well help us in driving things forward. Clearly, an immediate win is waste prevention. We can do that now. We should be getting on with it and deliver it as quickly as we possibly can. But this systems thinking, resource efficient design, manufacture, use, recycling, can do, yeah, that's the next area we've got to move and we've got to move on that fast. And using systems like uh, uh, the hotspots analysis that the Product Sustainability Forum is doing, for example, to focus our efforts where we're going to get the biggest impact could be part of that solution. The key thing, I think, is not only does this bring financial environmental benefits, but I think it's key for us as a nation going forward to deliver competitiveness going forward. Thank you very much for your attention.